Um, but there are some notices. Are they? Are they before or after? Is that a notice slide, was it? Um, so the main notice is that our Bible reading uh, notes, for anybody who'd like to get to understand the Bible a wee bit better, uh, three or four minutes every day, uh, a few verses and an explanation. And these are free uh, and they're in the uh, narthex. So you can take one away with you. If you don't have a Bible, we're happy to make sure you've got one of these as well. A modern version makes it easier. And um, if you would like them, drop through your letterbox. Uh, uh, if you're on Zoom, then um, send your name and your address to Jim. I think his email address up there, but it's in blue. I don't know if you can change that to a colour that we can actually see, but it's... I'd like to get, give uh, Jared some work to do, Jim. Uh, if you just highlight it and change colour so we can read it. Jim came in this morning and asked me to add this in, so that's why it's not just the colour, because I did it last minute. See the colour box? It's in black. Jai Dot McClinton at vtinternet.com. Yeah, okay. So, um, these are the Bible reading notes. There are some for you know, younger folk, teenagers, and there's some for adults. Um, I never know which is which. The adult one's that one, and the one with a uh, cool dude on it's for teenagers. Um, but please take these away, but they're really helpful. And over time, you really get to understand some of these difficult passages and also some of these uh, uh, amazing treasures and mysteries that God unfolds. Right, we're on Zoom record, got it, and we're at the sermon. And the sermon today is called The Why Road. Um, we, as a church, are on week four of this study in the book of Job. And it's a, an incredible window into what uh, theologians call um, theodicy. Um, and that's the study of God and why he permits suffering and evil. And it, it's helpful to understand these things um, because there are big questions that we can have as we go through life. Um, you know, life has many happy occasions like baptisms and weddings, but it also has tough times too. And um, we want to understand what God's like, and we want to be able to ask him the difficult questions. And we've been learning about this character called Job, and he's described in the first chapter as a man who is righteous. That means he lives in a right way with God. Um, he's a very, very wealthy man, and uh, God holds him up as an example uh, as to how we should live our lives, because he honours God in everything he does. The Bible also has a character called the Satan, um, and he's got this name, the, a bit like, um, I keep telling people, a bit like Ivan the Terrible. Um, it's meant to highlight that he's a terrible a notorious deceiver and false accuser. And he's always appearing uh, at the heavenly council meetings in chapters one and two. And his goal is to extort uh, permission to make Job suffer. Um, Job was wealthy, as I said, and when uh, uh, the Satan get permission to extort suffering upon him, he wiped out all his business. He killed his 10 children, and so on. All these disasters came upon him. And so the latest is that uh, in chapter two, uh, the Satan get permission to start to really turn the screw on Job and his health. And he's been sitting in an ash heap in the dirt. And all he's got left is his clothes and his wife. All his wealth's been taken, everything he owned, and uh, the Satan basically said, uh, Job is trying to save his own skin. If you let me have a go at that, he'll curse God and die. That's quite tough stuff, isn't it? But inadvertently, his wife actually adds to his pain. She encourages him to curse God so that he can die because it seems that his life would be uh, better than it is 
currently considering where he's fallen from. You know, this character, this Satan, the Bible tells us in a number of places that he seeks to deceive us too. He seeks to tell us that material things and, uh, you know, love and relationships, all these things uh, where other people are far superior, they are the things you should be aiming for. And of course, his desire is that we'll have all kinds of bad experiences. He'll deceive us, pull the wool over our eyes. And instead of having this amazing relationship with God that Job has, then uh, we'll have lost the battle as we go through the test of life. So this chapter is in two parts, and it falls after the scene has been set. And this section is written in Hebrew poetry. Um, in the original form, of course, it's been translated for us. Verses 1 to 10, we heard those terrible words that Job is cursing the day of his birth. And actually, he's cursing also the day that he was created in the womb. And then in verses 11 to 26, it turns into a lament. And a lament is a kind of passionate expression of grief. And it's often written as either a song or as a poem. Now, I guess we can all sympathise or empathise if we've known that, that Job is in a pretty low uh, level physically, emotionally, mentally. He's bereft of his children and his life, his good life, the blessed life that he had has been taken away from him. The Satan's goal is to get Job to curse God and die. But Job directs his frustration and his pain at the fact that he was ever born in the first place. This is a kind of subplot in this book. And it gets resolved when we get to the latter chapters, 42 verses 46 uh, particularly. And, you know, this week ends our first foray into Job. And next year we're going to go back there and we'll look at these verses then. But the shock... The shock of these words, and it's meant to be a shock, is to provoke a reaction. He's sitting in the dust and his three friends have sat with him there too. And they hear his words and his wife is there too. And it's meant to be a shock for us too. Some sort of explanation might just help him. And so he's articulating how he feels. And soon his friends will argue with him. And actually they'll cause him more pain. They'll ask him to doubt in his beliefs. But this is not just a, a moan. He's not just saying, this is not fair. Why is this happening to me? Life's not fair. Why should I suffer like this? I've been a good man. I've honoured God and I've been kind to all my workers and so on. But this is what I would call the why road that many people travel on while they live their lives. It's suggested by some commentators that actually today when Job's expressing these words, it is actually his birthday. He should be celebrating. And of course, that focuses his mind on that day that he was born. And of course, where it all started when he was conceived. It's kind of ironic that his cry is for something impossible to happen. You can't go back in time and make your birth be never happen, be irreversible. Um, it just can't happen. And from verse 3, the words day and night are really symbolically used in Job. Night is some kind of, kind of soothsayer. And instead of the person who announces Job's birth with great joy, he is... Uh, announcing something really unhappy and horrible instead of that birth. Of course, um, that's quite odd and upside down too. By verses four and five, he says, let there be darkness. And it's a direct reversal on what we know from Genesis chapter words, uh, Jennifer chapter one, where the words are, let there be light um, that was spoken at the start of creation. So he's always create, uh, calling for an, a kind of uncreation, uh, especially in his uh, birth. 
and conceiving. At this stage, in these early verses, Job's in such a low place that he's, he's not asking God um, to, to help out here. In fact, it seems completely out of his character, but he's looking at all the wrong sources. He's looking at the things that he's learned as he's gone through his life from other uh, ideas, other theories, um, other religions, and so on. And bereavement and suffering can have that kind of effect on people where they look to their own kind of sources for answers. Deep down, though, Job knows that it's foolish and wrong, but his world has tilted off its axis. And I've known that too, when the world just seems to cast adrift of everything uh, stable and normal. He wants someone, even if it's a bad source, to tell him what he wants to hear. But sadly, that happens. People quite often look to their own source for answers to their situation. And so in verses six and seven, night's getting cursed. A night's often seen as a, a, a pagan or a time when all kinds of sinful things occur. You know, it's kind of lock up your doors at night um, where horrible things can happen. Now this weekend's Halloween, and I know a lot of people like to have a bit of fun. But Halloween um, has its origins in all kinds of um, occultic and horrible things too. That's why people dress up as witches or ghouls, wear horror masks. And even the practice of duking for apples has past connotations with divination where they used to duke women under the water to test to see if they were witches. Of course, if they drowned, they weren't witches, and if they didn't drown, they were, and they bumped them at the stake and so on. So um, I don't know if you knew that, and I'm not trying to spoil your fun, but um, you know, I'm just trying to give you the picture of these kind of things and their origins. And you know, um, Job had all kinds of these, these kinds of influences in his life as he grew up too. Now, um, I don't know if you spotted the monster in the passage, verses 8 and 9, Leviathan. And this is a destructive monster that he's calling on to come and destroy. Now, Leviathan, different, uh, there's different theories about Leviathan. Some think it's a bit like a giant hippopotamus or a crocodile, but it's certainly something quite serious. But there is a, a, an ancient uh, 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 inscription um, in Aramaic that calls Leviathan a terrible, destructive serpent. And again, in Genesis chapter one, uh, in the early chapters of Genesis, we know that there's a serpent there who's an agent of the Satan who wants to deceive Adam and Eve. So the, 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 the parallels are uh, quite clear. Then Job calls for a complete blackout, just end everything. In my misery. And that's him at his lowest point. And it leads him to this next section, the lament, his grief in poetry or song. Now that may not seem like progress as you start to read or hear the words in the second section. But that's how pastoral work works. People express how low they feel, what's going on in their lives. And the pastor listens. So Job's kind of doing that as he goes into his lament. He wants people to hear and listen. He wants to unload. And you know the old proverb, a, a problem shared is a problem halved. And that really is at the heart of pastoral work. Somebody listens and cares. Now, Job's thinking so far has been pretty illogical. He would have more peace if he was dead. That doesn't make sense. But even if he were in that wrong place that he's suggesting where the dead people go, i.e. not heaven, that's the complete opposite to where you can find peace. Heaven is the place where you can find the most perfect and total peace. No more pain or tears or suffering 
are guaranteed there. So by verses 16 to 19, Job is reflecting on why he was born and his daft wish that his birth could be annulled. It's kind of just really a poetic cry for liberation from his pain and his grief. And it's his way of processing this in his mind. By verses 20 to 22, he is coming to his senses. And I use that expression because I don't know if you know the story of the prodigal son. But, you know, he had run away to, uh, uh, it says, uh, live a life of loose living. He was squandering all his money on wine, women, and song. But at one point in that passage, it says he came to his senses. And this is the stage that, that Job is at too. He's now facing his bitter reality. And in verse 22, sorry, verse 20, the he that's mentioned is God. He's now looking and turning to God at last for help. And he's asking God the questions that are on his mind. God, why do you allow such suffering and distress? His thinking is now becoming much straighter. He's looking higher for answers, and he asks, what's the point? Is there meaning and purpose in our lives? It's a question, a good question many people ask. Verse 23 states that life without purpose is meaningless. If we're just here as some sort of way of passing on our genes, we have no destiny. What is the point? But it's true that our destiny is often hidden from us too. So does God deliberately obscure that from us? Does God permit suffering to test us or to make our way more arduous for some good reason rather than a bad reason? And we've been looking at some of these questions already in previous weeks. Chapter 1 and verse 10, where we're told that Job had this hedge of protection all around him, that God put there because God loved him and because he loved God. We've been told that it's been removed, yet in God's sight, Job remains innocent and a man of spiritual integrity. But at this stage, Job's managed to get his complaint articulated and off his chest. And he's moving on in that process of grief and mourning. Some people talk about five different stages, and I don't know if the earlier verses here were about a denial. But maybe you've gone through that too. The Satan's false assertion yet again, it's proved wrong. Despite mental and emotional and physical torture and ailment inflicted by him upon Job. However, despite winning round two of this battle, Job remains in turmoil for quite some point from this time on. Right, that's all the bad news about the chapter. On a day when a young child has been brought for baptism, having recently been born and arrived in the world, I think you'll think this is quite a testing passage. You've just had to think through. You see, new life in the main is a time for celebration and thankfulness and joy. And our hope is that the child will be blessed and have a great life. I doubt there would be energy here today that would think otherwise for this baby and these other babies that are in our church today. And we as a church wish this for young James for sure. Yeah, whether you're at a family wedding or a baptism or some other significant gathering, there are people going through all kinds of different circumstances some in, in their own kinds of tough turmoil in their lives too. People who grieve or are bereaved, people who are anxious or depressed, 
people who have had losses of all kinds that they're carrying with them. So we want to uh, uh, be sensitive to others today too. It is a happy time. And we want those who are having a difficult time to have a happy time along with everyone else today. But the church and all Christians are always there to listen and to care and hopefully to be able to pastorally help those who are in difficult times, to help them, like Job, to make progress and to move on. But even more importantly is to help them to go to the right source for the answers that they need. To realize that the evil one wants them to not have that special relationship with God that he delights to give to anyone who asks and which can bring them a real and lasting sense of purpose, and satisfaction and blessing as they live their lives. All you need to do is ask for it with all your heart. But let's be aware that there's a false accuser who'll be telling us to hate life, to get more depressed, to drink away our sorrows, that our lives are futile, to die with no prospects of any future blessing and hope. I don't know if anyone's struggling here today or looking for answers, but if you are, I want you to know that we're here for you, pastorally, willing to offer a listening ear, not a, a ear of, or a voice of judgment, but willing to offer you a way of hope, real and lasting, eternal hope. The day, though, is for celebration. We wish that everyone will look up and see the joy of Sabbath rest, the blessing of baptism into the church of another child, to share in the joy that it gives, and along with us join to pray that James will be blessed, richly blessed, as he goes through his life. In a few moments, we'll hear a song, which is a, a, a desire for us to ponder these thoughts um, before James is presented for baptism. We're going to listen to this uh, hymn now. You can stay in your seats. I don't know if you'll recognize it. You want